just want to say my background, as you've heard, is different. I'm, I'm an economist, and I hope to bring you a little bit of a different perspective. It's great to hear, for me to hear and to learn from all the national pretrial experts here today. And I want to talk about how we can take all that great research that, that we've seen so far and translate some of that into dollars and cents. So what are the economics of, of uh, some of the research that you've seen today? And specifically, I'd like to talk about cost-benefit analysis. And this is a, a phrase that I'm sure most all of you have heard. It gets thrown around a lot. It could have a lot of different meanings. Uh, but really, when I think of cost-benefit analysis, what we're talking about is really an approach to policy making, a way of taking complex results, looking at things like effect sizes or uh, more uh, uh, regression analysis, statistical techniques that, that sometimes folks aren't sure what to make of, and then putting them into a language that, that really is easy to understand, dollars and cents. Everyone can really understand what dollars and cents are. So the strengths of cost-benefit analysis, again, I think it's using that common measurement to inform policy so that we can look and say, what are the most efficient uh, uses of our resources as policymakers? There are some challenges and limitations to cost-benefit analysis. It's often difficult to get the detailed level of data that we all need to do this type of work. And it can also be challenging to come up with precise estimates when we're looking at what does it cost uh, a crime victim uh, of an assault. Well, that's, that's difficult to, to get to. There's techniques to use, but there's certainly uncertainty around that. So cost-benefit analysis really has been used uh, for decades, but it's been uh, more focused on, on uh, public work projects like building bridges and roads, levees, those types of analyses. Uh, just recently, it's it started to expand into the criminal justice arena. So the Pew MacArthur Results First Initiative, one of the projects that, that I spent some time working on as well, is now working with 17 jurisdictions to build capacity to bring cost-benefit analysis to those jurisdictions so that they can look at the programs and policies that they're implementing and say, what type of return are we getting on investment with a goal in mind to move money to those places that have the highest return on investment and in some cases to stop funding things that, that don't have a, a good return on investment. Uh, the Vera Institute is also doing similar work with their cost-benefit knowledge bank. They produced a couple of white papers in the recent months that really go into some detail about how to do cost-benefit analysis within the criminal justice system, and they're really doing some good work. They're also doing the same type of thing, trying to build capacity so that local jurisdictions can continue and do this work themselves. The Crime and Justice Institute, who I, I've done some work with uh, actually in the, the county that Alex had mentioned earlier in Johnson County, Kansas. We have uh, worked as part of the Justice Reinvestment Initiative to build a local cost benefit model there. And then also uh, the project that I'm working on now is to build a cost benefit model uh, to look at pretrial detention. So I was encouraged to hear, Melissa, some of the work that you all are doing of, of uh, including a cost benefit component to your research as well. So when we look though at all this great research has been done, uh, pre-trial research has been done, and a lot of the, uh, the work that's been done for cost-benefit analysis in the criminal justice system, there's surprisingly little that's been done in the pre-trial arena. There, there's been one uh, fairly well done theoretical paper, but it hasn't looked at you know, any data, and it hasn't looked empirically at what some of the impacts of, of the research would be on the pre-trial system. Most of the research you see looks at the jail population. So as well, if we keep more people in jail and they stay longer, it costs lots of money. I think we all know that, that intuitively makes sense, but that's a little bit limited. If we only know that if, if someone doesn't use up the jail bed, we're saving money, but what about the other impacts? What about the criminal justice uh, impacts to uh, the system for those people that fail to appear, for those people that reoffend, the cost of victims? So there's, there's more costs that really need to be included in that to make it a good cost-benefit study, not just including the, the, the pretrial detention cost. So how, how can we do that? What's the framework we'd want to look at for, for doing a cost-benefit analysis? And really, that the cost of detention is an important place to start. That's likely going to be the most expensive part of a, of a, a pretrial decision is keeping people in jail longer in those expensive uh, jail bed days that are used. But there are also other pieces that are very important to estimate. So what is, what is the the value of avoiding crime or avoiding failure to appear. Uh, how can we monetize that? And then there are, there are now methods to do that, and those are being done. Uh, you know, Vera Institute has talked about how to do that through their cost benefit knowledge bank and the, the results first work as well as some of the work that I'm doing with CJI. There's also the ability to use this to, to uh, measure 
uh, some of the other potential impacts of the pretrial system. Does that mean I've, uh, I've gone over my, my five minutes? <laughs> wow, you guys are serious about this. <laughs> I know. Um, so looking at things like recidivism reduction. So if individuals are, are released early and they're less likely to recidivate, we can monetize that. Or if we look at individuals that are released pretrial and they're less likely to serve longer jail sentences and longer prison sentences, again, we can monetize those things. But as of, uh, as of today, I haven't seen any research that has done that. So this is, is, is a new area that, that, that needs to be examined. So again, how will we do this? Really, there's the standard economic tools that have been developed by, by others that can be used in this arena following some of the, the leads that are being done in jurisdictions around the country through the Results First Initiative, the, the Cost Benefit Knowledge Bank, and others. One of the important pieces to really look at here is a marginal cost. And I don't have enough time to go into this in great detail, but many of these types of studies make the mistake of looking at average costs and just taking you know, the hundred and whatever dollars a day for a jail bed. We know that if we reduce the jail population by small amounts, we don't save a lot of those fixed and, and, and administrative costs. So it's important to look at this in a little bit greater detail, try to get at that, that level of marginal cost. It's also important to incorporate victimization costs in, in any type of study that you, that you do around cost benefit, because if, uh, that's certainly an important factor in uh, policymakers' decisions about the criminal justice interventions. We want to look, try to reduce victims, and there are ways of monetizing those impacts. There's a number of studies that have, have looked at that in, in recent years. So finally, as I close, I wanted to just give you an example. So keep in mind, this, this is an example. This isn't, uh, we, ha we haven't been able to do this yet in the jurisdiction. We're working towards gathering the data to do this. This is an example of, of what you've heard some individuals talk about today, that a growing number, well, it's still small, but a growing number of jurisdictions now have risk tools to look at, at the risk uh, of an individual committing crimes while they're out pretrial. So what we have here is a, a graph of that, the distribution the risk distribution, you could think of this as 100 individuals lined up, right? The least risky down by the 0%, the most risky over towards the 95%. Uh, so just think of 100 individuals lined up here uh, in line by their risk level. And so again, this is research that not, I wouldn't say it's common, but it's growing and, and more and more jurisdictions are, are able to look at risk in their decision-making process. So if we look across this, we can see those lowest risk individuals maybe have a one or 2% likelihood of committing crime while they're out pretrial. As we move all the way over, we get some individuals almost up to 30% a chance of committing crime while they're out, the highest risk individuals. So what cost benefit can do is it can take a graph like this and, and translate it into to dollars and cents. So really the only thing that's changed here is the axis. Instead of looking at the likelihood of an individual committing a crime while they're out, we're looking at the, the expected dollar value of those crimes. And so we look across and the, the least risky individuals, I don't know what that number is, maybe $50. They're, they're expected to cost $50 in damage to, uh, to victims and, and the, the taxpayer costs of them committing crime. The most risky individuals, you can see this graph really starts to take off when you get to those, uh, the, the very few that are really high risk, and maybe it's you know, $2,200 worth of damage that we expect those individuals to cause. Now again, this is, uh, this is just an example. Uh, we haven't been able to do, gather this data yet. This is, gives you an idea of how this can be used. And one other point I want to make before I go on to the next graph, and I think uh, Alex had mentioned this, uh, what they're looking at Johnson County. I think we all are aware of this, but sometimes it gets lost in this type of presentation, is that, that looking at risk in dollars and cents doesn't make sense for every offender. There are certain crimes where individuals need to be in jail because of the sense of justice and the damage that they've caused the victim. So, I just want to make sure I say that, but most individuals we can look at in this type of uh, lower level misdemeanors, property offenses, we can look at in this, in this framework. So finally, we can add in here the cost of detaining these individuals. And so that's the, I guess that's a goldish colored line, about $1,500. So we can look at if these individuals stayed in jail the entire time, this, this would be the cost. And we can look at the intersection of that and see where you know, not worrying about the severity of the crime, but holding all else constant, where our equilibrium point would be. And in this case, somewhere around 92%. So if we were to take those 100 individuals that were lined up, there'd be seven or eight of these individuals that uh, it's actually a better idea to keep them in jail because the, the damage that they're causing by being let out is greater than the cost to keep them in jail. The other 92 or so individuals in this example 
are, are lower risk, they cause less damage, it's less expensive, to, uh, it's, it's a better idea to let them out of jail. Now, I think it, this was mentioned earlier, that when we're looking at uh, non-risk-based systems where it's, it's based on your ability to come up with cash to get out of jail, it usually doesn't matter what the risk level is. So we're getting two suboptimal outcomes. One is some of these high-risk individuals can get out of jail because they can afford to. They're causing more damage than, than, uh, than the cost of them staying in jail. And then we have a lot of these low-risk individuals who don't get out of jail because they can't afford it. And that's also suboptimal because it's costing the system more than the damage that we'd expect them to cause upon release. So that was all I had. Uh, the, the one thing I wanted to just say in closing is that uh, I think this is, I, I was, again, encouraged to hear that the work M Melissa's doing to, to further this cost-benefit work at pretrial, but this is really a, an area that I think needs a, a lot of additional research because it's, it's relatively undeveloped at this point. So thank you.